All right, please open with me in your scriptures to John chapter 12. We're going to be looking at chapter 12, verses 37 through 50. If you're looking in a pew Bible, it's going to be on page 899. And as we're turning there in our passage this morning, please remember that Jesus said, The words that I've spoken are spirit and life. And may God give us grace to receive these words as that, as, as our very life this morning. John chapter 12, starting in verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. So that the words spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their hearts and hardened, he has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Nevertheless, many even of the authorities believed in him, but for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. And Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. And whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. I've come into the world as light, so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. For I've not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me himself has given me a commandment, what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's pray. Our God and Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. We ask, God, that you would take full possession of us now. We ask that you would reign supreme in our hearts, in our minds, in our ears, in our understanding. God, we ask, as the sovereign king of the universe, God, that you would not allow our hearts to be hardened like Israel's was in this passage. We know, Lord, that if you let us go our own way, that's exactly what will happen. Left to ourselves, we are just like the Israelites in this passage. We will not believe. Father, we ask that you would grant us revelation this morning. You are God. You are worthy of every breath that we breathe, every faculty of our soul, every action that we perform. When we were dead in our sins, having no eyes to see, no ears to hear, no understanding to know, you made us alive. And we ask God that by that same power, you would make us alive again this morning. Lord, your words are the words of life. To whom shall we go? We ask these things, Lord, because you are God and you speak and the heavens and the earth were created. Speak now, God, and create love for you in our hearts. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, please be seated. It's the second Sunday of our Advent season leading up to Remembering when Christ came into the world, his first coming last week in verse 28, we saw a purpose of Jesus' coming. Jesus says, but for this purpose I have come into the world. Father, glorify your name. So last week we saw that Jesus came into the world to magnify the worth of his Father. 
This week he gives us another reason for his coming. Verse 47. I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. Why did Jesus come into the world? Why did he put on flesh and break into our time and space? It's because he came to save lost sinners. That's the, it's the greatest story ever told. Greatest story ever told. Yet what we see in our passage this morning, when Jesus wraps up his public ministry, is that this saving comes at the cost of his own people, Israel, completely rejecting him. John warned us back in chapter 1 that this rejection from Israel was going to come. In John chapter 1, verse 11, it says that he, Jesus, came to his own, the Jewish people, and his own people did not receive him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him, and this should astonish all of us. How could a people who have been expecting the Messiah for thousands of years, who were entrusted with the oracles of God, which prophesied about Christ, and they gave signs about him coming, finally reject him when he arrived? This is, this is unthinkable. <laughs> the Messiah has come. We reject you. And skeptics of the scriptures have pointed this out and, and they've concluded, well, Jesus couldn't have been the Messiah because how could a whole nation who were expecting him in the end reject him? But that view, that skeptical view, grossly misunderstands and underestimates the power of sin and the plan of God. Sin is not simply Mistakes that human beings make like they would make a mistake in their checkbook. Sin is utter rebellion against the living God. Utter rebellion. Psalm 2.2. Listen to how David talks about the sin of the kings of the earth. He says, The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. And against his anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart. And cast away their cords from us. That's what sin does to the human heart. It says, God, get away from me. Sin is wishing that God is dead. And so it's no wonder that the Jews rejected Jesus Christ in his first coming. All mankind, Jews and Gentiles alike, are born under the power of sin. It would be more remarkable if they received Christ than if they rejected him. That's the normal path of life. But this rejection of Christ by the Jewish people was not some cosmic accident. It was the very plan of God. God planned for this. As Peter addressed the Jews at Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, he says, Men of Israel, hear these words. This Jesus was delivered up according to the definite plan of God, whom you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. Jesus being rejected by his people and being crucified was part of God's plan. Jesus could not save the world apart from the cross. And so, the cross was both an ultimate sign of Israel's rejection of Christ and the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan to save the world. Those two things are going to be unfolded in our text by John, explaining to us why Israel did not believe and how God planned their unbelief. Now, these two ideas are so interwoven in our text that I don't want to offer you an outline this morning because I felt like that would have break it up too much. So what we're going to do is we're going to deal with verses 37 through 43 first and then we're going to go to verses 44 and 50 in our application. Here's our big idea. If you get lost at any point in this sermon, come back to this. God planned the rejection of His Son so that He could be reconciled to sinners. God planned. God planned the rejection of His Son. When we get to chapter 12 and Israel is rejecting the Messiah, that's part of God's plan. And God is using that rejection to reconcile sinners like you and me to God. If Israel would not have rejected God in this chapter, you would not be saved. 
So Israel's rejection of the Messiah is what brought joy to the world. So let's look to our passage. Now chapter 12 is the end of Jesus' public ministry on earth. After this, Jesus is going to retire in chapter 13 and he's going to go in the upper room with his disciples. For four chapters, he's going to spend pouring and pouring into his disciples. And then when he emerges, he's going to be crucified. And so this is the last place where we see Jesus speak to the public world. And so this is significant. But in our passage this morning, it's actually not Jesus that speaks first. It's John. John breaks in to this narrative and he gives us a chilling account of Israel's unbelief. In our, in our Christmas stories, and our Christmas songs, we often have lyrics and words of great joy and it's a, it's a joyous season but when Jesus was born there was actually a very chilling prophecy that was spoken over him by Simeon they bring Jesus into the temple to have him dedicated in Luke chapter 2 and Simeon is there and he, and he speaks over Mary and he says behold this child is appointed for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign that is opposed. Sweet baby Jesus being brought into the temple, and Simeon says to Mary, that child will be for the fall of many in Israel. He's going to be opposed. That's part of the Christmas story. From the beginning, Jesus was to be opposed. From the beginning, Jesus was meant to be for the fall of many. That's at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. Now as we get to the end of Jesus' ministry in John chapter 12, John circles back to that chilling truth. Verse 37. Though he, Jesus, had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe in him. Think of all the signs that Jesus performed in this gospel. He turned water into wine. He fed the 5,000. He walked on water. He healed the invalid. He raised Lazarus from the dead. And so John is dumbfounded at Israel's belief. In fact, in John 15, 24, it says that Jesus performed signs that no one else ever had. And so John is, you can hear his tone coming through in verse 37. Though he had done so many signs before them, they still did not believe. Jesus was the best preacher that the world has ever seen. He was the best miracle worker that the world has ever seen. And yet his own people did not believe. Why? Because this is what he was appointed for. Israel would not believe Verse 38, why would Israel not, would not believe verse 38? So that the word spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. Lord, who has believed what he heard from us? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? This unbelief of Israel is a fulfillment of prophecy. They didn't believe because it was foretold that they wouldn't believe. John is quoting Isaiah 53.1. And just two verses later, later, Isaiah sharpens the stick of Israel's unbelief in that same chapter. And he says that Christ would be despised and rejected by men. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief, as one from whom men hide their faces. Mankind and Israel's natural reaction to Jesus is to reject and despise him. That's what Isaiah prophesied. That's why Isaiah says, to whom, of the Lord, to, to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? The prophet is asking, Lord, whom have you revealed yourself to? Because Israel does not believe. Lord, whom have you revealed yourself to? Do you feel where John is going here? In other words, he's saying the thing that makes man believe is not their own mental faculties, but the revelation of God. 
The gospel of Jesus Christ can be proclaimed upon the rooftops. It can be on NBC News. All of your favorite newscasters, if you have any, can be preaching the gospel and nobody will believe. Unless the arm of the Lord is revealed to them. Left to oneself, no man will believe the gospel. And so it's so disheartening in modern evangelicalism when you read a, a very popular pastor in one of his books, he says this, quote, It is my deep conviction that anybody, anybody can be one to Christ if you discover the felt needs of his or her own heart. You, you can win someone to Christ if you just discover their secret inner need that they have and then... That's the formula. You win them to Christ. That's not the message of the Bible. Belief in the gospel does not rest upon the ingenuity of man or our own cleverness. It does not rest upon a preacher's ability. Thank God, because if it rested upon my ability, you'd all go to hell. Belief in the gospel does not rest upon discovering and then meeting the felt needs of unbelievers. Salvation is from the Lord. That's the message of the Bible. It's from God. From first to start. From first to start. From first to last. See, I told you. If it depended on me, you'd be in trouble. From first to last. Case in point is from the Exodus. When God brought Israel out of Egypt, guess what God did? He met all of their felt needs. He released them from slavery. He gave them manna from heaven. He gave them water from the rock. And then Moses says to them in Deuteronomy 29, 2 and 4, he says, you have seen all that the Lord did before your eyes in the land of Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his servants and to all his land, the great trials that your eyes saw, the signs and those great wonders. But to this day, the Lord has not given you a heart to understand or eyes to see or ears to hear. Nobody can be one to Christ unless Christ gives them eyes to see. This is, this is how Peter was one to Christ. Peter, who do you say that I am? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus says, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. This is how Paul was one to Christ. In Galatians 1, 15 and 16, he says, God had set me apart before I was born and called me by his grace and was pleased to reveal his son to me. This is how Lydia was one to Christ. In Acts 16, Paul was preaching and it says that the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. If you have been one to Christ, it is not because some preacher discovered your felt needs or because you have seen some great miracle. If you have been one to Christ, it's because the living God who made the heavens and the earth said, breathe, live, come alive. That's how you are saved if you are saved. It's no other way. It's not the product of your will. Just like you being born the first time is not the product of your will. Oh, the symmetry of the Gospel of John. Do you realize that John chapter 3 opened up with Jesus preaching about the new birth? And now, as Jesus' ministry comes to an end, what is John talking about? The new birth. Having eyes to see, ears to hear, a mind to understand. And God wants you to feel this. God wants you to feel this. He is absolutely sovereign. That means he's king. That means that whether you live or whether you die, it's up to the Lord. Whether you go to heaven or whether you go to hell is completely on God. Completely. And that does not negate your responsibility to believe the gospel. He commands you to believe and he says, I'm in control. At the same time, both of those are true. And he wants us to feel this. God is most honored 
when we feel our utter dependence upon Him. When we, when we sense, God, I am lost and I'm undone. I'm ruined without you. That is what it means to honor God from first to last. Israel did not believe. Why? Because of the, the arm of the Lord did not reveal it to them. But John is going to say more. God had a plan in Israel's unbelief. Look at verses 39 through 40. It says, Therefore, they could not believe. For again, Isaiah said, He has blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, lest they see with their eyes and understand with their heart and turn, and I would heal them. Consider the logic here of John as he moves from verse 37 to verse 40. Four times, John points out the design of God in Israel's unbelief. So I'm just going to hit it from a treetop perspective. Verse 37, we see that Israel doesn't believe in spite of all the signs. Why? Verse 38, so that, that's the first clue that God designed this unbelief, so that Isaiah's word that the arm of the Lord is not revealed to everybody would be fulfilled. Verse 39, Therefore, that's the second clue that God planned their unbelief. Therefore, they could not believe. Verse 40, for, that's the third clue that God planned their unbelief. For God blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, lest, here's the fourth clue that God planned their unbelief, they see, understand, turn, and God would heal them. These people were rendered incapable of Believing in Christ. See, these verses do not allow us to say, well, God simply um, foresaw their unbelief and then he predicted it. That's not what these verses say. John gives us purpose statements here. He says, so that, verse 38. He says, therefore, verse 39. He says, for, verse 40. These purpose statements show us that God planned on Israel's unbelief. He is in control. This wasn't some cosmic hindering of God's purposes. Now, perhaps to many of us, these verses paint a very harsh picture of God. As if God is holding the door of heaven shut against sinners who want to get in. And if that's you... Consider that God wants you to wrestle with these ideas to see a bigger truth. When John says, he blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts, John is quoting from Isaiah 6.10. Isaiah 6 is the great throne room scene where it says, In the year that Uzziah died, I saw the Lord seated on his throne, high lifted up, his his." Robe filled the temple and the angels cried out, Holy, 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 the whole earth is full of His glory. And when Isaiah saw this glory of the Lord, he was utterly undone. He says, Woe to me, I am lost. And after that vision, Christ commissioned Isaiah to preach to Israel. But he got, one of the, he got perhaps the hardest task a preacher could ever get. He said, I want you to go preach. How long, Lord, until everybody is an unbeliever? You're going to fail. Your, your preaching will not bring believers into the kingdom. Why? Because I'm going to harden their hearts. Why was God going to do that? Because God had made a judicial verdict against Israel. A judicial verdict. You see, as a whole, the nation of Israel had continued to rebel against God. Prophet after prophet that God sent to them, they rebelled. They rejected. They were unbelievers. And so God was hardening them in their unbelief. And that's what John means in our present passage. You see, God is not starting out with neutral human beings. God is blinding the eyes and hardening the hearts of sinners who have already rejected the grace of God. 
He's hardening them in agreement with the choices that they have already made. So consider four things that D.A. Carson offers as a remedy if you struggle with these verses that says God hardens the heart of Israel. Consider these four things. Number one, God's sovereignty in salvation is never pitted against human responsibility. God's sovereignty and salvation is never pitted against human responsibility. Verse 38 tells us that this crowd rejected Christ in spite of all the signs. And then verse 43 is going to tell us why. Because they loved man's glory more than God's. Number two, God's hardening here of Israel is not the capricious manipulation of an arbitrary dictator Cursing morally neutral beings. See, we, the problem is, is that we approach a text like this and we see God harden their hearts and we think, oh man, that seems so unjust. These are not morally neutral human beings. These are rebellious sinners like you and me against a holy God. This is a holy condemnation of a guilty people who are condemned to do and be what they themselves have chosen to do. Number three, God's sovereignty in these matters is a cause for hope. God's sovereignty in these matters is a cause for hope. Over the Christmas break, you're going to see family and friends perhaps that you haven't seen in a while and they're going to be people that don't know Christ. Do you pray for them? Do you ask God to change their hearts? If God is not in control of their hearts, there's no hope in praying for them. God, the fact that God is sovereign over the, the reins of the human heart gives us hope that people can actually be saved. Number four, God's sovereign hardening is the stage for ultimate redemption. God's sovereign hardening is the stage for ultimate redemption. Remember our big idea that God planned the rejection of his son so that he could be reconciled to sinners. When Paul opens up his discourse on Israel in Romans 11, this is his climactic point. Why did Israel fall? So the Gentiles could be saved. Verse 11, through Israel's trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Verse 12, failure means riches for the Gentiles. Verse 30, Gentiles have received mercy because of Israel's disobedience. The reason why you're saved, if you're saved as a Gentile, is because God caused Israel to be hardened. This was... God's plan to save the world. Jesus was crucified for sinners because he came to his own and his own did not receive him. God planned that Jesus would be rejected by Israel so that Christ would die for sinners like you and me. If there was no rejection, there was no crucifixion. If there's no crucifixion, there's no payment for sin. And if there's no payment for sin, you and I are going to hell. And so this hard text is the ground for everlasting joy. Joy to the world. Because Israel was hardened and they crucified our Lord. John doesn't end there in this passage with the hardening of Israel. He, he moves on. He, he shows us why on the human level Israel rejected Christ. Let's look at verses 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many, even of the authorities, believed in Christ. But for fear of the Pharisees, they did not confess it, so that they would not be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. Within the Jewish leadership, there were many authorities who came to at least believe in the facts of Christ. And commentators are, are very split on this particular passage. Many of them say this was a real faith, but a weak one. And others say this is a completely false faith. And when I came to this passage, I was pretty sure I knew, and now I don't know. 
On the one hand, we've seen lots of false faith in this gospel. And if what John is describing here is mere mental assent to the truth claims of Jesus, then certainly these authorities were not saved. But, if on the other hand, they just had an a infantile and weak faith that many of us have experienced, well, we're afraid to confess Christ. Peter is going to be afraid to confess Christ just a few days from here. And so I'm not altogether sure whether these people were saved or not. But whether these authorities were really saved or not, I think the main point is not that, but the main point is at the end of verse 43. It says, For they love the glory that comes from man more than the glory that comes from God. This verse is the reason why Israel as a whole did not believe. So setting aside the authorities for a moment, the root of Israel's unbelief and the root of all unbelief is loving the glory of man more than the glory of God. That's why unbelief exists. Israel didn't believe because they had a glory problem. Israel didn't believe because they had a glory problem. So let's try to tie these verses together. John quotes Isaiah. Isaiah quoted from Isaiah chapter 6 and Isaiah 53. And in verse 41 it said, Isaiah said these things because he saw his glory and spoke of him. Whose glory did Isaiah see? He saw the glory of Christ. And the glory that he saw was two things. He saw the suffering servant in Isaiah 53 and he saw the holy, holy, holy God of Isaiah 6. And when Isaiah spoke these things to Israel, Israel said, no. We don't want a suffering servant. That's not glorious. And we don't want the one who would push us off our own throne. The one who is equal with God. God sent them exactly what they needed. Don't you see? God was not hardening their hearts by hiding the truth from them. He was hardening their hearts by sending the truth. That's how God hardens hearts. You know, I can harden my own son's heart by giving him a righteous command. If you are parents, you know that this happens. I can, I, if my son is being particularly rebellious on a particular day, I can say, do this. And I know the response he's going to do. He's going to rebel against me. God hardens hearts by preaching true things, glorious things, gospel things. And what we do with it in our own sin is we say, no, get away from me. Doctrine, gospel doctrine does that to sinners. Haven't you experienced that before? The more you press into a friend or a family member with the love and kindness of Jesus Christ, what happens if they're not older? They push you away. But this hardening of Israel, this hating of God's glory because of man's glory was according to God's own plan. Let's, let's apply this to our lives. First of all, our doctrine our doctrine from this morning's text is, it could be from verse 43, they love the glory of man more than the glory of God, but I wanted to change it. Here's, here's what our doctrine is. All of our assets are liabilities before God. Because that's what it means to love the glory of man more than the glory of God. All of our assets are liabilities before God. Let's just focus our attention on verse 43. Loving the glory of man more than the glory of God is the root of unbelief in the human heart. This loving the glory of man here means loving anything that makes much of me. Loving anything that elevates me. And it can be anything. Anything can grab a hold of your heart and cause you to love the glory of created things more than the glory of God. It, it can be simple things like the car you drive, the sports teams you follow, your reputation at your job, your debt-free lifestyle, your theological knowledge, your reputation amongst your girlfriends, where you live. 
how nice your house is, what kind of clothes your kids wear, what friends you hang out with. Anything under the sun can be used to block out the glory of God. So this is what loving the glory of man means. It means finding your source of joy outside of Christ. Loving the glory of man means finding your source of joy outside of Christ. Your source of joy. Not that you can't find joy in other things, but finding your source of joy outside of Christ is what it means to love the glory of man. And what this means is that all of our assets, the things that we bring to the table, are liabilities when it comes to the gospel. Jesus said in this gospel, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus is saying, I'm your satisfaction. Come to me. Believe in me. You'll never want again. I am the answer to your life. Why don't people believe that message? Because they put Jesus on one side of the scale and they put all of their assets on the other side of the scale, the things they receive joy from, and then they weigh them out. And then those assets become the ground for unbelief because they would rather have them, whatever they are, than Christ. This is how Paul says it in Philippians 3. Whatever gain I had, assets, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For His sake I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Paul counted all of his Jewish assets, and he listed them all. A Hebrew of a Hebrew, circumcised the eighth day, a, a Pharisee. He listed all of those assets, and he said all of them were done because they prevented him from gaining Christ. Whatever prevents you from gaining Christ is a liability. did not believe. That's why Paul didn't believe. And so Paul's exhortation to us is to count everything that you have, every source of joy that you have outside of Christ as something that blocks you from believing and trusting in Him. How do we do this? How do we do this? Let's go to our duty. Believing the, our duty is to believe the glory of Christ is better than the glory of man. To believe. So our duty is just simply to believe, to be convinced that the glory of Christ is better than the glory of man. After verse 43, Jesus speaks for the last time in his public ministry. Verses 44 through 50 is the last words that Jesus speaks before he goes to his disciples. We don't know the context. We don't know who he's speaking to. This is a summary of Jesus' ministry. This is the big idea of Jesus' ministry. And in this summary, Jesus gives us fuel to believe that the glory of Christ is better than any other glory. So let's look at verses 44 through 46. Jesus was sent from the living God and is the living God. That's the summary. Let's look what he says. Verse 44, Jesus cried out and said, Whoever believes in me, believes not in me, but in him who sent me. So Jesus is saying, look, I'm not asking you to believe in me merely as a man. The living God sent me. If you don't believe in me, you don't believe in God. There's so many religious people today that say they believe in God, but they want to bypass Jesus. Jesus says, no. If you don't believe in me, you're not believing in God. Verse 45, whoever sees me, sees him who sent me. Meaning, I am the living God. If you believe in me, you are believing in the living God. That's who you're believing in. Verse 46, I've come into the world as light so that whoever believes in me may not remain in darkness. Loving the glories of this world, loving the things of this world more than Christ is remaining in darkness. What, what is your reputation compared to the forgiveness of sins? 
What is your social worth compared to never coming under the wrath of a holy God? What do you care what people think about you if you're going to live forever in perfect communion with Christ? What do you care? Look at verses 47 through 48. If anyone hears my words and does not keep them, I do not judge him. For I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. The one who rejects me and does not receive my words has a judge. The word that I have spoken will judge him on the last day. That's our title for today's message. I I came to save the world. Oh, what a statement that is. I didn't come to judge the world, but to save it. Jesus Christ had the right to judge the world when sin first entered it. Jesus could have judged the world 2,000 years ago and wiped us all out. But he came to save. He came to save the world. That's why Israel was hardened, so that he could be crucified, so that we could be forgiven of our sins and reconciled to God. But as he closes his ministry here, Jesus warns us of the second coming. In his second coming, judgment will come. His words will judge every human being who refused to believe. No one will escape. Everybody that you know, will be judged by the words of Jesus Christ. And this is terrifying. Jesus' words determine the everlasting destiny of every human being that's ever lived or ever will live. That's how Jesus is closing his ministry. I will judge the world in the end. Why would you chase after other glories? Our delight. God's commandment is eternal life. God's commandment is eternal life. Let's look at Jesus' last words as we close. Verses 49 and 50. Jesus says, For I have not spoken on my own authority, but the Father who sent me has himself given me a commandment. What to say, what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. Jesus' last words here tell us a great deal about his ministry. My commandment, my Father's commandment is eternal life. Father sent Son into the world so that we could live forever. Those are Jesus' last words. My Father's commandment is eternal life. Therefore, I'm going to the cross. Jesus' last words here have us in mind. I came to save you. I came to give you everlasting life. Believe in me and you will never die. Believe in me and I will wash you as white as snow. Believe in me and I will be punished for your sins and you will be rewarded with my righteousness. Believe in me. That's why the Father sent me to grant eternal life. Let's pray.